case in the present day. He is also, also the author of Privilege, Harvard and Edu Education of the Ruling Class, and Grand New Party, How Republicans Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream. So please join me in welcoming Ross. Is that good for AV purposes? Are you guys good? And everyone can hear me? Okay, great. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you all for being here and for having me and for welcoming my family, um, who are hopefully surviving somewhere without me for the, <laughs> the next 40 minutes or so. But So I have you guys twice, um, which is sort of an unusual experience for me. Um, and so I'm going to try something uh, that will hopefully work. And um, if it doesn't, you know, weekend we'll never see each other again. <laughs> <laughs> but so I'm going to talk um, and actually hopefully try and keep you guys pretty much on schedule, but talk for the next um, 30, 35 minutes or so and sort of try and for the purposes of your weekend think of this talk as sort of laying out what I see and maybe you see as well as sort of the challenges facing public Christianity right now. Um, and then this evening maybe we can have a conversation about solutions. <laughs> and with, I put a strong emphasis on conversation because I don't really have any solutions. So hopefully I can talk fairly briefly and then we can have a pretty freewheeling discussion um, for most of, most of the evening session, if that, if that works for you guys. Um, so I, I think we'll, I won't do a big Q&A right now and we'll just sort of assume we can have a big sort of maybe slightly um, alcohol and discussion, discussion, <laughs> wide-ranging discussion um, in the evening. But so I, if that sounds good, I'll start. So I, I find it useful in doing talks about Christianity to sort of talk a little bit about my own religious background. Um, so I'll start there. Um, I grew up in southern Connecticut in the 1980s and 1990s, which was for you guys a very, very long time ago. Um, it feels just like yesterday. But, uh, and my parents, uh, my mother went to Yale and my father went to Stanford. I lived in New Haven, Connecticut, and my dad was a lawyer, and in many ways I had a childhood that was sort of a very conventional, upper middle class, liberal, Ivy League parents kind of upbringing. I went to private schools. Um, we, my earliest political memory was walking down the street with my mom to cast a vote in the 1984 election. She was very insistent for Geraldine Ferraro. <laughs> Walter Mondale was incidental <laughs> to the vote. Um, and most, you know, and most of my sort of school friends and peer groups were sort of, you know, New England, liberal, upper middle class, um, sort of good centrist Democrats in their politics and fairly secular in their, in their um, theological worldview. And, but there was also a sort of parallel track in my childhood because my mother had sort of fairly severe and fairly hard to diagnose and treat um, allergies, chemical sensitivities, uh, basically all the kind of stuff that now in our more enlightened era has created the aisles upon aisles of, um, uh, you know, detergents without scents or dyes. You know, if you shop at Whole Foods, there's sort of endless shelves of this kind of stuff all pitched to people with these kind of weird sensitivities. But 30 years ago, there was none of that, and there was really no awareness of these sort of weird illnesses of modernity, if you want to if you want to call them that. And most of the people who suffered from this kind of stuff would end up, you know, living in sort of stripped down huts with, you know, out in the middle of nowhere with absolutely no sort of, um, no sort of access to uh, the stuff of modern life, basically. And, and so my mother, in the course of sort of looking for unorthodox treatments and cures for, um, for, for her illness, um, ended up taking us to a faith healing service, faith healing services, I guess I should say, um, that were part of a ministry run by a woman with the actual first name of Grace um, in Connecticut who had had a near-death experience and returned from it with a kind of charismatic gift. And these were um, services that were basically sort of Pentecostal in form, if not in necessarily theological substance, but there was guitar playing and preaching, and then there was um, a blessing line, and she would pray over people, and they would be slain in the spirit, and she would go around these high school auditoriums and 
Milford and Danbury and Waterbury, these Connecticut towns uh, where this wasn't a sort of normal thing, <laughs> and would pick, out, would pick out people in the crowd and say, I think your lower back is bothering you, I think you've had arthritis for a very long period of time, um, and so on. And this, and, and this, um, and so my mother was actually, I think, literally picked out of, picked out of the crowd one night and went out in the spirit and spent 30 minutes sort of on the floor of a uh, Southern Connecticut High School auditorium. Um, uh, and that was, uh, not surprisingly, a somewhat life-changing event. And so while I was li living my fairly conventional upper middle class liberal childhood during the weeks, on the weekends we would drive around Connecticut and New England and go to these services and I would watch my parents speak in tongues. Um, and, and so that was sort of, that was sort of the, the sort of two, two tracks um, of, of my childhood. And this, we didn't spend my entire childhood attached to this ministry. Ultimately, it sort of opened into a kind of wider tour of American Christianity. So I was baptized and initially raised um, Episcopalian. And then we spent a fair amount of time coming out of this healing ministry in Pentecostal and evangelical circles. My parents were briefly involved with a much more disastrous <coughs> attempt to um, bring Christian revival to an Ivy League campus at Yale. Um, and we did things like drive all the way to um, Toronto for this famous Pentecostal vineyard outpouring at the Toronto mm -hmm. Airport Vineyard Church, um, where I didn't just get to see my parents speak in tongues, I got to see them roar like lions. Um, <laughs> I was 13 at the time, I was fairly fairly intense. Um, <laughs> but, but so this journey ended um, for, for my family, um, the way such journeys sometimes do, with my parents, and particularly, again, sort of my mother was the driving force behind this, converting to the Roman Catholic Church when I was, I guess I was 16, and then I became a Catholic at 17. So I'm in the unusual position of being neither an adult convert nor a cradle Catholic. Um, but, you know, whatever the adolescent place in between is. Um, and for my mother, it was a very much a sort of carryover of her sort of intense mystical side and, uh, you know, the Eucharistic adoration and various saints were sort of the bridge from the charismatic side of American Protestantism to the charismatic side of American Catholicism. For me, it was, again, much more conventional. I read G.K. Chesterton. I was like, this sounds pretty good. Um, I was very relieved to join a church where nobody would put their hand on my shoulder and ask me in the middle of the service to testify to how Jesus had changed my life, <laughs> <laughs> 17 and awkward. You know, all, all, many of the things that Protestants complain about with Catholicism, oh, the road prayers and everybody sitting at the back at mass. I'm like, sitting in the back. <laughs> um, so anyway, so that was, that, was my, that was my religious background. And it also sort of coexisted because we had this, because my mother had these illnesses with um, a sort of third aspect that, again, wasn't you know, didn't normally fit with the other two, which was that we spent a lot of time um, going to health food stores and eating at vegetarian restaurants. And again, all of this was long before the days of Whole Foods and for any of you who live in DC, teaism, these sort of restaurants that have the, you know, the, the fancy plates of brown rice with a little seaweed sprinkled on them. To get that in 1987, you had to go to some weird basement covered with sawdust in Hartford, <laughs> Connecticut, where you had a tie-dye shirt and sort of slop tofu onto the plate. And, um, but, but, that, but that world was different from sort of, you know, the liberal secular upper middle class, and also very different, though, from the sort of evangelical, Pentecostal, and ultimately Catholic world, um, because it was itself religious, in a sense. It was sort of deeply infused with post-60s New Age spirituality, and all these health food stores and restaurants had their little bookstores attached, and you would read, you know, books with titles like "Women Who Run with the Wolves." Um, and, but, but so that and the sort of religious aspect of that, I think, wasn't, you know, I didn't necessarily think about it that much. Although when we went to a three three day macrobiotic camp in Vermont, the sort of religious aspect became hard to miss because the lectures were all about how this. Japanese diet was ultimately going to bring about world peace and then eschatological things beyond that. Um, and there were some people who blended it with aliens, but I can't, it was a long time ago, I can't remember how that worked. Um, but, but all of this was sort of the, the baggage that I then carried into 
Ivy League education and then a career in American journalism. And I became a journalist basically, I mean, I did sort of college journalism, not Christian journalism, but conservative journalism at Harvard. And I was the editor of the conservative paper and the token conservative columnist at the Harvard Crimson, which was good preparation for my life <laughs> uh, and, but And then I became a sort of political journalist in the Bush presidency, basically. And so I sort of entered into this already existing and very potent debate about religion and public life in the US that you know, went back, I mean, went back all the way to the founding in certain ways, but it went back really to the 1970s um, and to, I think, the sort of, you know, the sense among Christian conservatives that there was a sort of liberal secular elite that was sort of, in a sense, taking the country away from them and that, you know, that this was sort of, there was an, a felt need um, for a kind of political populist Christianity to um, sort of revolt against this elite misgovernment. Um, and then by the Bush era, that had sort of inspired a counter reaction on the left from liberals who were very, very, very worried that we were about to turn into a theocracy. Um, after Bush won re-election in 2004, this was the number one explanation among a lot of people for how this could have possibly happened. It was that all those people out in Jesus land, you know, had, had <laughs> voted based on moral values and that the next thing was gonna be that um, you know, secular Americans were all going to have to wear numbers on their sleeves, and there was a lot of very sort of hyper paranoid um, stuff circulating around that then fed into the kind of heyday. I think it's a little bit past now of the so-called new atheists, where um, you know it wasn't just the problem wasn't just American Christianity or American fundamentalism; it was religion itself. And for a while, you couldn't you know turn on C-SPAN without seeing Richard Dawkins having his way with some well-meaning but hapless Anglican bishop <laughs> on a panel somewhere. Um, and so you know, those, those were sort of the religion and public life debates that were going on when I started participating in them. And they were fun debates, and I participated in them fairly vigorously, I guess. And I had one really unfortunate occasion where I actually debated Christopher Hitchens. And fortunately, the, I think the videotape of that has been lost forever. It was a dark day for God. I was a last minute fill in for Andrew Sullivan, if that means anything to you guys. It was, it was just bad on all counts. Um, but while participating in these debates, I think in large part because of my sort of somewhat peculiar, though also in certain ways very American sort of childhood and religious background, I, I had a very strong sense that, that the binaries of, through which these debates were described, covered, and participated in missed huge swaths of the story of what was actually going on with religion in the United States. And on the one hand, they missed the sort of deep and dizzying internal diversity of American Christianity, which I had sort of passed through in various stages as a kid, and which didn't sort of, e wasn't easily pigeonholed into these simple, you know, sort of evangelical versus liberal, you know, sort of secular versus religious binaries. And then they also missed sort of the diversity of religious sensibility beyond the Christian churches, which you know I had picked up at macrobiotic camp and with you know women who run with the wolves, but which people were obviously picking up in all kinds of places in all kinds of ways. I mean, you could just just walking into yes, back then you would walk into a Barnes and Noble. Now it's harder to do that, but um, you know you walk into a Barnes and Noble and you look at the sort of religion and spirituality section of the bookstore, and you see a lot of books that are sort of engaged with culture war debates and. You see a lot of books that are sort of, you know, fairly conventional um, sort of treatments of topics from a traditional Christian or Jewish or Muslim or Hindu perspective. And then you just have this vast swath of literature that is, you know, talking about sort of spirituality. It is sort of functionally spiritual in the sense of sort of blending aspects of different religious traditions, describing different kinds of spiritual quests, you know, Elements of it are new age, elements of it are self-help driven, elements of it are prosperity gospel driven, but none of it, again, sort of fits into a world where it's just Christopher Hitchens and the Pope, um, you know, sort of locked in mortal combat, um, I guess in the next life now for Hitchens, but sort of for all, for all time. Um, and so that was sort of the genesis of the, the book that became, that became Bad Religion that tried to sort of put all this in context and try and um, not sort of, not sort of overturn the 
sort of secular versus religious framework because I think obviously that is a big part of the story of you know how we got where we are today, but complicated and sort of talk about the other things that were happening um, and had been happening in American religion for the last 40 or 50 years. And so the argument of the book in, in a nutshell is just that what has happened in American life over the past, I guess now it's three generations, um, is a decline of traditional institutional Christianity that has not necessarily coincided with a decline in spiritual interest and religious belief. Um, and my ideas for how and why that happened uh, overlap in many ways, I think, with what, what Peter was talking about at the, at the very beginning, that there are these sort of deep structural forces that have, that have driven this, that have made people less likely to find traditional Christian ideas, sort of small o orthodox Christian ideas, compelling without making them likely to become actual sort of fire-breathing militant atheists, or even really to become secular in the sort of way we use that term in sort of conventional discussion to basically mean Sweden, right? America is not seemingly on the way to turning into Sweden, and really even Sweden isn't quite as Swedish. Um, if you, you know, dig below the surface of sort of, of, of poles as, as, as people think. Uh, but basically, uh, there is a sort of deep resilience, as you would expect, of the religious impulse um, in American life and Western life writ large, even in an era when people are less likely to find that impulse satisfied by traditional Catholicism, Protestant denominations, and so on. Um, and I think in thinking about why this happened, again, I think since my, my thoughts overlap with, with Peter's in many ways, but I also think it's a little bit useful to sort of distinguish between the sort of, there are sort of what you might call deep problems of modernity um, and sort of more immediate problems of the post-60s era. And these are obviously related to one another, but when you talk about sort of the deep problems of modernity are, for, for Christians, you know, the kind of sort of Charles Taylor style secularism writ large, the sort of partial disenchantment of the world that has just made both atheism and belief seem like equally viable options. And that sort of optionality of faith is, you know, I think in certain Taylor's thesis has been contested in different ways by historians of religion, but I think it, it is a useful way to look at what has shifted from medieval Christendom to the present day, right? Just sort of the basic optionality of religion is itself a revolutionary fact. Um, and then that joins with and overlaps with, I think, these sort of deep, these sort of philosophical shifts, some of the stuff Alistair McIntyre has talked about, that the, the idea that you raise about sort of the, the, sh the shifting conception of what morality is, what the good life is, what religion is, how these things fit together. These are all deep forces that have, you know, been with us going back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. I think, though, it is also useful for us to look back at the 1960s and 70s, and this is the conventional wisdom in many ways, but I think it's right, as a sort of distinctly revolutionary period that, that either accelerated sort of aspects of those deep problems or sort of posed, posed new ones. Because there, there are things that happen in that era that are legitimately new, that pose legitimately new and immediate challenges for, for, for Christian belief. And one of them obviously is the thing we end up talking about in these discussions all the time, and that's the sexual revolution. But we talk about it for a reason, because there really is a kind of deep structural shift um, with the advent of the birth control pill, the divorce revolution, and so on, that, that sort of severs traditional New Testament sexual ethics from worldly common sense in a way that hadn't been the case going back in certain ways for all of human history, but certainly going back in even in the modern West, right? And I mean, even in the modern West, there's a reason why so many Victorian moralists were so eager to say, well, you know, we, we can't believe in Christian doctrine anymore, but we need to keep sort of Christian morality for, you know, the good of society and so on. There was all, there was an enduring sense even um, even sort of post-Reformation in a more secular world that sort of basic elements and including sort of basic elements of sexual morality um, just made sense and, you know, work, worked for people and that, and that, you know, and led to human happiness, human flourishing and so on, even if Christianity wasn't true. And that sense is much, much weaker. Um, since the 1960s and 70s, and the sense is much, much stronger that actually Christian sexual ethics are actively perverse, 
make people unhappy, make them twisted, tortured, closeted in the case of gay people, and so on. Um, and even if it doesn't go that far, there's just a sort of baseline sense that there's, that Christian sexual ethics are just totally unrealistic, right? And this is related, again, to sort of both specific technological developments like the birth control pill, but also just sort of changes in the way people live that all of you guys are experiencing right now, just sort of the fact of what people describe as sort of adultescence, right? This long gap between, I mean, really between the onset of sexual maturity and when sort of American society, the American economy and so on, expects people to get married, feels like people are ready to get married and so on, just creates challenges for Christianity that have existed in different times in the past. You know, in colonial America, people got married pretty late and so on. Um, but, um, but are, at least for our purposes, a sort of new and fresh and difficult <laughs> challenge. And so you have the sexual revolution. You have, I think, in the 60s, a sort of real acceleration of the phenomenon you were talking about, sort of consumerism and material wealth um, that, you know, again, Modernity has always been richer than the eras that preceded it. America has always been richer than the societies that have preceded it. But for the post-war generation, there was just a level of sort of cornucopian abundance um, that just hadn't been available to people uh, before and changed both sort of people's attitudes generally, but also just like the careers that people chose. Like a lot of the problems that both the Catholic Church and Protestant denominations have had in terms of attracting talent to the ministry aren't just about in the case of the Catholic Church, celibacy and sex, though it is about that, it's also just about the levels of the, the gulf in sort of terms of material rewards and social prestige that's available to somebody who becomes a corporate lawyer, an investment banker, I won't cite journalists because God knows that's not true, but you know, a host, <laughs> but a host of elite professions. And the ministry was still an elite profession in many ways in the 1930s and 40s, and it, that simply isn't the case in the same way today. Um, so you have sex, you have money, you have just an acceleration of globalization, um, of, and of sort of the availability of encounters with the dizzying diversity of the world, I guess is one way to put it. And it goes to the, the point that I guess somebody raised in one of your, one of your focus groups at Dartmouth, right? The idea that you, you go to college and you've been raised in one tradition and you see all of these other traditions and they all look good. I think that has happened on a much larger scale as you know, first television, then the internet have sort of brought the entire world into people's homes and living rooms and so on. That it, again, it isn't something that's making, turning people into atheists. It's maybe even increasing the level of spiritual interest in certain ways, but it's just made it much, much harder for people to believe that their particular religious tradition, either the one they were raised in or one they're being introduced to, could possibly contain the fullness of truth. Um, and then finally, and this is definitely a sort of post-1960s issue, when you talked about polarization and partisanship, I think that's impossible to get away from as sort of a source of significant problems for the Christian churches, both on the left and on the right. And I think it was first a problem that sort of undid the Christian left in the, in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. There was this sense that basically liberal Protestant denominations were just the Democratic Party of prayer and since they had embraced sort of fairly fashionable ideas about a sort of more secularized Christianity in that era, it became impossible to basically give people involved in those churches a reason to you know, get up on Sunday morning when you could accomplish the same thing by donating to your local Democratic candidate or marching in a protest march and so on. Um, but then something similar happened um, in, in, on sort of the, the other end of the spectrum with the Christian right, and I think we all know this very well over the last 20 years, but you certainly know it in elite culture where to be a Christian is to be associated with the Republican Party, to be a Republican is to be associated with Christianity. And for people who didn't like George W. Bush or don't like Sarah Palin or don't like some other representative figure, or don't like, didn't like Jerry Falwell, Pat Roberts, and whoever you want to name down, down the list, the pitch for Christianity gets a lot harder to make. And it just becomes a lot harder in general for public figures who represent Christianity publicly to find a place to stand that is distinctively Christian and not defined as liberal or conservative. And the example I'd like to use is imagine how the history of mid-century America would have been different if Billy Graham in the mid-50s had decided that the best way to win America or the world for Christ was to run for president as a Republican. Or imagine how different 
that same era's history would have been if Martin Luther King had decided that the best way to effectuate the civil rights revolution would have been to run for president as a Democrat. And yet, flash forward 30 or 40 years into the 1980s, and for figures like Jesse Jackson, and Pat Robertson, and Al Sharpton, it becomes much more natural to sort of identify your public ministry with a specific political party. Um, and I think that that change says a lot about sort of deep changes in American culture, but it just sort of also just crystallizes the challenge for Christians right now, which is that people look at you and say, if you're making arguments in the public square, people expect those arguments to fall into one partisan category or another. And as soon as Christianity finds itself just falling into a partisan category, it ceases to be, I think, an authentic and compelling Christianity. Just, it is very unlikely, even obviously you're likely to think that one political party is better than the other if you're engaged in political action, but it's very unlikely that one particular party and one particular time and place has happened to encapsulate the fullness of God's truth for what, you know, for the relationship between religion, politics, and the common good. Um, so those, those I think, are, those are my four, and they overlap with your four, I guess, sex, money, globalization, slash relativism, and polarization. Um, but they have given us the world we inhabit now, and I think it is useful to understand that world in the language of the subtitle of my book, How We Became a Nation of Heretics. That the, the term heresy is actually very useful for understanding what's going on in sort of religious culture in the US today. Um, because you get into these debates often where you know people will say, well, you know, we were a Christian nation, now we're a secular nation. We were a Christian nation, now we're a post-Christian nation, and so on. You know, you sort of run through these different narratives. And I think if you look at sort of, if you look at some of the most popular manifestations of non-Orthodox Christian religion, spiritual sensibility, whatever you want to call it in American culture, they're still deeply influenced by Christian ideas, right? I mean, we, you know, we, whether it's something, um, I mean, you, you can just, you just start with an example like the Da Vinci Code, right? The popularity of the Da Vinci Code is inseparable from American culture's continued fascination with the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. A book like the Da Vinci Code would have no interest to anyone if the whole if its whole point wasn't to say you can keep Jesus. He just will, you know, happen to look more favorably on the way you're living now than the Jesus of the New Testament, right? And if you read Dan Brown's complete oeuvre, I haven't read his complete oeuvre, but I'm working on it. I'm not a completist yet. Um, but that's you know, the mess Brown's books are pro religion in some sense. They're you, you know, maybe he would say he's pro spirituality, but he has a very sort of it's sort of new agey, you know, it's sort of deist in certain ways, it's sort of mystical here, but he basically wants to repurpose Jesus for somewhat different theological ends. And that's what you see, I think, all over the place in American religion today. There's a reason that Deepak Chopra can't stop writing books about <laughs> Jesus, right? I mean, you know, or, and, and then there are also many figures who are sort of just more explicitly Christian you know, figures like Joel Osteen, everyone, basically everyone involved in sort of the, the ideas of prosperity theology and so on that also clearly depart in significant ways from, from historic Christian orthodoxy. Um, and so that's, you know, in the, in the framework I use in my book, the first half is sort of this historical story of how we got here, and the second half is attempts to sort of do a kind of theological analysis of the Da Vinci Code, of Eat, Pray, Love, which is a book I recommend everyone in this room read. I, not, um, it's, it is a fascinating um, sort of example of how spiritual pilgrimage is conceived of and pursued in our era. And to read it in parallel with sort of conventional Christian conversion narratives with a Dorothy Day or a Thomas Burton or something, I think tells you a lot about both the opportunities and the challenges for for Christians today. It's a book that sort of contains this sort of deep and totally authentic spiritual yearning. It, you know, is sort of focused on raw and I think authentic religious encounters with the numinous, with the divine, but it is all focused towards an endpoint that doesn't involve anything like Thomas Merton ending up in a Trappist monastery, right? The endpoint of the book is Elizabeth Gilbert 
finding happiness with a handsome Brazilian divorcee in Bali. Um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, right? But like, but but that I mean, but that distinction is sort of I think is sort of crucial to understanding what what we as Christians are facing in in, in this era. It is not sort of the death of spiritual hunger. It's not the death of the supernatural and the mystical. It's just a sense that you know, that the path to happiness doesn't lead through sort of committing yourselves to a particular religious tradition, does certainly doesn't lead through submitting yourself to something larger than yourself, but rather the path to happiness involves encountering God and then sort of picking and mixing and matching pieces from different religious traditions to suit the way you already want to live. I think I, you know, I have a line about refrigerator magnet poetry in the book that sort of fits with, with what a lot of, um, a lot of that style of spirituality is doing. Um, and, and so, so that, to, to the extent that my argument contributes anything really original to sort of discussions of religion in the US, I hope it's, it's that. The idea that both, I mean, not just Christians, but everybody should take seriously the theology that's embedded in popular culture. Because there is a lot of theology embedded in popular culture. Theology is, I, I think, basically inescapable, but it's uh, if it's more inescapable than you might think if you spend just a fair amount of time looking at the places that most people sort of encounter the spiritual and the numinous and the quest for God um, in their own lives. And therefore, from a Christian perspective, you know, the sort of the struggle against secularism, the arguments about whether God exists or not and so on, as important as they are, they have to exist together with an engagement with the way that most I don't want to say ordinary Americans, that sounds condescending, but Americans who aren't, you know, weirdos who just read off ed pages and blogs all the time, <laughs> how, how those Americans engage with the deeper questions about, you know, the meaning and, and meaning and purpose and, and so forth. Um, and I think so, for the purposes of your discussion this weekend, I think this is both, this, this argument, if it's correct, is both good news and bad news, right? The good news is that, you know, religion isn't going away. Right? That even in an era where more and more people are, are you know, no longer identifying with traditional Christian denominations and so on, and, and every, every, every year since you started seeing headlines about the nuns, the number of people who identify as nuns has, has gone up. Um, and but even in, that, even in that kind of world, the arguments that people respond to are not, act you don't actually have to convince people to be interested in um, you know, the ultimate questions about meaning in the universe. Um, and that's particularly true, I think, once you get beyond the slice of the United States that's represented by Ivy League universities, elite newspapers, and so on. Because I think Christians engaged at the elite level in public life, it, it almost tends to make you think the cultural challenge is harder than it is. Because the elite level in American life is quite secular, and sort of more secular than the popular level. And so there's a, you have a sense of sort of pushing against people who just really don't understand why they should give religion the time of day. And that's, that's a real and powerful phenomenon. But for the culture as a whole, it's not the most important phenomenon. And the work of conversion for the culture as a whole doesn't have to proceed by sort of overthrowing, it doesn't have to overthrow secularism. It's not, that isn't the crucial challenge. That's the good news. The bad news, though, is that the old sort of secular versus religious framework, I think, led a lot of American Christians to think, well, there's the secular elite, and they're bad, but the country is with us. The country is still a Christian country, and we just have to mobilize the masses, you know, the moral majority, to use the language of the 1980s, against the secular elite. Um, and that isn't right. I mean, and it, maybe it was true in, to, it, maybe it was more true in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when these arguments were first were first being made. But today, the masses aren't with us. Like there's no, you know, there's no sort of vast Christian army in the heartland waiting to, you know, <laughs> waiting for the right leader to march on Washington and, you know, tar and feather Anthony Kennedy. And, <laughs> um, there, there's that's the country is is not, um, you know country is in a different place, and that place, you can use the language of Christian heresy, you can use the language of spiritual, not religious, you know, it doesn't really matter what language you choose, 
the country as a whole, you can use language of the bell, you know, the, the bell curve, I think, as, as you describe it, is fits American culture as a whole, maybe in a slightly, maybe it's in a slightly different place on the axis than it is at Dartmouth, but there is that bell curve there. And so that's, the, so, so it isn't just a question of sort of, you know, approaching, approaching the culture, approaching a culture that's already Christian and figuring out how to mobilize it against an elite that isn't. The, the culture itself has to be converted, renewed, and, you know, reintroduced to what are for Christian sort of very basic concepts and ideas. Um, so that's that's sort of a, that's sort of one framing of, a, of the challenge. Another another way to look at it is that, and it's something that I've thought about a bit since since I finished the book because you know the the way it works is that you write a book like this about American Christianity and you write it from you know coffee shops in Washington D.C. with stacks of you know stacks of out of print books about debates from the 1960s piled around you and then in promoting the book you actually travel to real America and meet actual American Christians which would have been very helpful for the writing of the book that's not, not actually how it, how it works um, and so that so I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years traveling to uh, you know everywhere from Vancouver, which I know technically isn't in the U.S., but we're all friends here, um, <laughs> to North Dakota, to Tennessee, to Houston, um, to California, and, and, and what, on the one hand, those experiences of going to, usually it's sort of middle-tier Catholic and Protestant colleges and speaking to groups and so on, in, in a certain way, that experience has been, it's given me a tremendous sense of optimism, right, because once Again, once you get outside of Washington, D.C., the Acela Corridor, you know, the Northeast and so on, it really is, you know, remarkable how much vibrancy and vitality there is in American Christianity all over the country. And not just among, you know, people in their 60s, but people in their teens and their 20s as well. Um, and so that experience definitely, it definitely makes, it gives you a sense of, you know, Christianity in the U.S. isn't going away. Right? There's going to be a Christian culture embedded in the broader American culture um, for, you know, as far as the eye can see. And that is, you know, a tremendous opportunity. There's tremendous opportunity for those pockets of vitality to become something more than pockets. But at the same time, that kind of traveling also highlights sort of, and this is an idea that, um, you know, shows up in James Davidson Hunter's book about, you know, about sort of how Christians have tried and failed to change the world. But the vitality in American Christianity tends to be on the periphery. It is not in the center. And, it, you know, it is in the, you know, really impressive little Catholic college I visited in Bismarck, North Dakota. You know, it's in Union University, you know, in the middle of Tennessee that nobody in New York and Washington has ever heard of. It's in these, it's in these places that are you know important and powerful in changing people's lives, but are often marginal to the culture as a whole. And you have to not let yourself be sort of lulled into a false sense of security about the culture as a whole by just sort of moving from pocket to pocket, because you have to be willing to sort of look at the general statistical drift of the United States and recognize that um, you know it can both be the case that there is real vitality in American Christianity, and that the culture as a whole is drifting further and further away from what we think of as, as Orthodox Christian faith. And so this leaves, um, this leaves. I guess I'll, I'll just conclude by saying there's there is sort of an unusual. There's an unusual difficulty to to this kind of landscape, um, because I think the models. When, when Christians think about their history, the sort of conventional models, and you know, they're just models, obviously there's a lot more complexity, but the models people tend to fall back on are Christendom on the one hand and the catacombs on the other, right? And so once you sort of convince people that America is no longer a Christian nation in the sense that, you know, it was never a truly Christian nation, but it was more Christian in certain ways in the past than it is today, once people become convinced of that, you, it's an easy leap for a lot of believers from that to saying, okay, well, we've lost the culture and now we're going to either be sort of, you know, persecuted and face the lions in the arena, and I'm not sure I'm ready for that, but there's at least some romance to it, um, <laughs> or I'm going to take, you know, the sort of the Benedict option, right? I'm going to go, you know, cultivate my own vineyard and raise my 
two kids or my seven kids, you know, and run an organic farm and, you know, homeschool my kids and teach at a Christian college and so on. Um, and, and eventually, you know, watch America fall apart around me and then we'll emerge from the rubble and, and rebuild. <laughs> and and the, the, the problem with that option is that the culture isn't that, it isn't far gone enough for Christians to have the right to withdraw from it. Um, but it is far gone enough that it is difficult to see how it is regained and rebuilt. And I think this is a problem you particularly see in the case of my own Catholic Church because you know, the, the Catholic Church is built for a population of, right now it's you know, 70 or 80 million Catholics, right? And you know, it's built around huge archdioceses and huge cathedrals and huge bureau bureaucracies and so on. And there's a sense in which if you look at the actual state of the Catholic Church, you, see, you would say, well, it would be a lot better if we sort of, you know, shrank precipitously and, um, you know, maybe if a lot of sort of lukewarm, self-identified Catholics didn't identify as Catholic, that would be clarifying and, you know, we would have smaller, more beautiful churches and, you know, smaller, more, you know, more orthodox religious orders and so on. And, 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 and that's in certain ways happening, right? It has to happen in sort of big northeastern dioceses. Parishes are closing and there's consolidation happening and so on. But that process coexists with the reality that all of those 70 million Catholics in the U.S. are baptized and confirmed Catholics. They're, they're actual Catholics. They may be, you know, theologically miseducated. Mis mis they may be in a state of mortal sin, you know, but they're one good confession away from, you know, not being in a state of mortal sin anymore. And God knows, you know, I'm, all, I'm always one good confession away from, from being, being in a better state. So, but so you can't, it's just very difficult, and particularly if you're in a leadership position in the church, you can't just say, well, to hell with, and, you know, that choice of words, but that, you know, to, to hell with the sort of, you know, with the lukewarm and the liberal and the disaffected and so on, and we're just going to have our smaller, purer church, because as Christians, as Christian shepherds or Christian intellectuals or whatever the case may be, you have an obligation to your fellow believers, to your fellow baptized Christians, whatever kind of situation you're in. And so that, when, when I think about sort of where Christianity goes from here, it's that challenge that has to be addressed, this sort of, this sort of combination of, you know, decline that hasn't yet led to a sort of, you know, smaller, purer core. And the question is, you know, either you're sort of managing the decline or you're figuring out a means to revival. But either way, you can't just withdraw from, from the struggle. You have to sort of address yourself, address yourself to the whole scope of the problem and not just to sort of building particular communities. So um, it's 10. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you on schedule and leave off there. And it's OK. Is it? Good if we just do a yeah, big discussion ask, yeah, tonight. Discussion, yeah. Can you guys, you know, <laughs> hold all of the fruit that you're planning to throw at me until the <laughs> evening, and we can we can go from there. That's great. Perfect. Okay. Thank all right. You. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>